So it's great to be here with all of you at Greenbelt Online. I have a lot of material that I want us to go through together in our time together today. So let's just jump right into it. We're in week nine of our series called Convergence, but this is week two out of three where we're specifically looking at spiritual gifts. We started this last week, and if you missed last week's message, I would encourage you to head on over to our YouTube channel, well, after this service is done, of course, and check out that message there. Um, but so talking about spiritual gifts, again, just so that we're all on the same page when we ask ourselves the question, what is a spiritual gift? This is the working definition from the book Convergence that I'm using here in this series. So this is how the book defines a spiritual gift. It says a spiritual gift is a special attribute given by the Holy Spirit to every member of the body of Christ, according to God's grace, for use within the context of the body. They are endowments or special skills given by God that enable us to make our unique contribution. They're not natural talents, but divine abilities that enable us to do ministry to build other people up. You see, every single follower of Jesus, everyone who puts their faith in Jesus to save them from their sin, receives the Holy Spirit. That's that seal of God, that the third person of the Trinity comes into you, makes you new. That's how you are born again. And you are made a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then you also receive spiritual gifts, all of us have them, and all of us are called to use them. Over all the years that I have been pastoring, um, whether it's here at Greenbelt or the other churches where I've had the privilege to serve at, sadly, I meet lots of Christians who feel like they're not called to serve in ministry. And I, I poke back at that lovingly, of course, but the reality is um, it really doesn't matter what you feel about that issue. It's because the Bible is quite clear in its teaching that every Christian has a gift and every Christian is supposed to use that gift for the building up of other Christians. See, the church was never meant to be something where 20% of the people do all the work and 80% of the people who attend a church do nothing but consume the work of the other 20%. I don't know how that creeped into church ministry, but it did, and it's not biblical. And so we have to do kind of this hard work to figure out how everyone can play their part, how everyone can fulfill their role in the local church. We read in Romans chapter 12, verses four and five, it says this, just as each of us has one body with many members and them members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. You see, I need your spiritual gift at work in the church in order to help build me up spiritually. And I know you might be thinking that sounds incredibly weird because isn't it the pastor's role to use his spiritual gift to build us up? Yes, of course it is. But the flip side is equally true. And your spiritual gift is there in our body to help build me up to build up one another. We all have a role to play in this. And so the big idea that I gave last week is the same big idea this week, and it's going to be the same big idea next week as well. And it's this. As a church, we want you to know your spiritual gift and to serve out of them. As a church, that is our deepest desire, is for you to know your spiritual gift and that you are actually serving people out of that gift because we believe that is the way you will feel closest to God. And that is the way that you will accomplish way more for God because you're actually doing the things that God has created and called you to do. So we started last week and I presented how the 21 spiritual gifts that we can read about in the New Testament in the book Convergence are broken up into three different categories. Last week, we talked about the love gifts. 
And in the love gifts, kind of the definition for that is the love gifts are, um, they manifest the love of God in practical ways. Next week, we're going to talk about power gifts. And power gifts, what they do is they demonstrate the power, presence, and reality of God. And today in our time together, we're going to look at word gifts. Now, word gifts clarify the nature, action, and purposes of God. So like I said earlier, we've got a lot of material I want us to kind of go through together today. So we're actually going to look at six different spiritual gifts in our time together today. We're going to talk about teaching, exhortation, apostleship, leadership, shepherding, and evangelism. Woo! Sounds like a lot. Those are some pretty big words. Are you ready? I'm ready. I hope you are ready. So again, let's jump into this today, talking about these word gifts. Now, just something before I talk about the gifts individually, something to, that we see in the teachings of these gifts and in the example that we see of these gifts in scripture, they tend to, not always, but they tend to be less person to person than the love gifts that we saw last week. The love gifts are clearly gifts that are used one person to another person. These gifts, though they can do that, and there are examples of that, these tend to be over larger groups of people. Okay, So just kind of keep that in mind when you think about it. it they can be used person to person, but they tend to more often be used more person to, to larger group of people. Okay? So let's unpack some of these. Well, not some of these. Let's unpack all six of these together today. So the first is teaching. It's the spiritual gift of teaching. Right? The spiritual gift of teaching right, is Bible-centered, right? and it clarifies God's truth. Right? This gift isn't so much about proclaiming God's truth, Rather, it's more about unpacking God's truth, right? People with this gift tend to help groups of Christians understand themes and principles of Scripture. Right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 and 28, we read this. It says, And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers. Right? This spiritual gift of teacher is very different than the natural ability to teach that some people may have. You know, whether you're a teacher in an education system or whether you're a coach and you help guide people and you teach people that way. We have amazing teachers who, who are in our church family. But if you were to ask them if they had the spiritual gift of teaching, they would actually say, no, I don't have the spiritual gift of teaching. I've got a natural skill set in teaching, and I've got some training in teaching to become a really excellent teacher. You see, the difference of that natural ability to teach and the spiritual is this supernatural way that God works, right? It's in the teaching of the Bible, it's not in teaching mathematics or it's not about teaching world history, but it's about teaching the scriptures that bring the scriptures alive in such a way to the people receiving the teaching that the teaching moves from their head and that it actually transforms their heart. One of the key ways that you can know you've got a spiritual gift of teaching is that when you unpack the word of God, to people, when you unpack the Bible to people, people start changing how they live their lives. <laughs> it's not just about, wow, that was really cool. I didn't realize that's what the Hebrew meant. It's no, people change. People implement this into their lives. That's that supernatural thing, right? There's nothing that I can do to get you to change your life. Nothing. There is nothing I can say in my own strength and ability that will ever get you to change your life. It's only a spiritual gift of teaching, of teaching God's word that comes out and speaks to the Holy Spirit in you to go, oh my goodness, I need to do something about this. 
You see, teaching is such a crucial and important ministry in the life of the church. In fact, we could see it was so crucial and so important. We see it happen. Um, sorry, we see the implementation of the urgency of sound teaching right in Acts chapter 2. Right? Acts chapter 2 says this uh, in verse 42. It says, they, being all these new Christians who are coming to faith in Jesus, it says they devote, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. We see some spiritual practices mixed in with spiritual disciplines, uh, sorry, with spiritual gifts at this point. And um, because the reality is, is just like back in the days of Jesus' time, just like today, there's so much teaching out there. And I say, do intentionally say that with air quotes. There's so much teaching that says it's spiritual teaching, but it's actually not coming from a spiritual gift of teaching. And that kind of teaching just blows people all over the place. Oh, I believe this. Oh, I believe that. Oh, I follow this. Oh, I follow that. And they just never get fully grounded in this. They never get fully grounded in God's call on their life, never get fully grounded in the gospel. And they're just blown around by every type of teaching. So this teaching gift is so crucial in the life of the church. The next gift that I want us to look at is uh, the gift called exhortation. Uh, other um, translations, other people call this the gift of encouragement, the spiritual gift of encouragement. Right? In Romans chapter 12, when the apostle Paul is talking about spiritual gifts, he says this in chapter 12, verse 8. He says, if it is, so if your gift is to encourage then give encouragement. <laughs> I, I love these very simple verses, right? It's kind of these very clear-cut commandments, right, that Paul's doing here. He goes, if you have the spiritual gift to encourage, well, maybe you should go home and you should pray about it. You should seek the Lord and whether you should use it. You should, you know, maybe take a nine-year course and get your master's degree in divinity or you should do all of these things, <laughs> No, Paul doesn't say that. He says, if your gift is to encourage, then give encouragement. Don't, you don't need to think about it. You don't need to pray about it. You just need to encourage somebody, encourage people, right? In fact, we could see all throughout Paul's writings that Paul probably had, we don't know this for sure because it doesn't say this, but Paul probably had a spiritual gift of encouragement, of exhortation. You can see this again and again and again in his writings to the church, whether it's the church in Rome, whether it's the church of Philippi, whether it's the church of Galatia, whether it's the Corinth church. There's always this tone, this attitude, this heart to exhort them, to encourage them to pursue Jesus more, right? The difference, uh, the, sorry, the spiritual gift of encouragement, of exhortation, what it does is it takes the spiritual gift of teaching. Now, someone who's got the gift of encouragement might have the gift of teaching as well, or they might not. But the things that Christians have been taught through a spiritual gift of teaching, the person with the gift of exhortation then comes along and said, hey, remember what Pastor Kevin said about this? How are you implementing that in your life? How are we holding one another accountable on this? How can I encourage you to make that more real in your life? See, the person who's got this encouragement gift, they take that biblical truth and they help people apply it to their lives in very practical ways. You can kind of think of it as the spiritual gift of cheerleading. It's like, I'm rooting for you. I know you can do it. I know God wants to see you victorious over that sin in your life. I know God wants to see your life changed and turn around. And I'm going to come alongside and I'm going to encourage you. And I'm going to even kind of push you a little bit. I love this definition here in the book Convergence. This is what it says about exhortation. It says this. It says, the gift of exhortation is the capacity to urge people to action in terms of applying biblical truth, to encourage people generally with biblical truth 
or to comfort people through the application of biblical truth to their needs. One of the ways that Pastor John in his book describes this gift of of, uh, exhortation, he says, he calls it the gift of mercy with a kick. (laughs) And I really relate to that statement because I think this is one of my spiritual gifts as well. I jokingly call it the spiritual gift of cheerleading, where we can unpack and we can teach the scriptures, but then with a smile on my face, because I love you, I can kick a little bit. (laughs) I can push you a little bit because my deepest desire is to see you victorious. My deepest desire is to see you set freed from false teaching, to set you, to see you set free from sin, from lies, from pain, from suffering, all of these things that the world would throw at us, all the junk and garbage that the world tries to feed us. And man, nothing makes my day more than when I can give a little kick in love and see your lives changed. Nothing brings me more joy than that. So we talk about teaching, talk about exhortation. Now let's jump into the gift of apostleship. And I think this gift gets a lot of confusion because not only is there a spiritual gift of apostleship, there's also a biblical office of apostle. And there's a lot of tension over this. There's a lot of tension in this idea of, well, what does this mean? What does apostleship mean in the world today? What does it mean to be an apostle? All of these kind of things. There's all these different tensions that exist. Now, I'm just going to share my opinion. This is my opinion and my understanding of these um, texts that talk about apostleship, that talk about the apostles. Again, I'm going to hold this very loosely like this. I'm not going to split the church over it. I'm not going to divide anything over it. I'm not going to kick anybody out of the church over this thing. But in my understanding of scripture is that apostles, the actual apostles is a limited number of people. That the apostles were the men directly chosen by Jesus. You have the 12 initially, and then you have Paul chosen by the resurrected Jesus to bring the good news to the Gentiles. And these were the men who were inspired, filled by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. And so the apostles end with them. But then you might be going, but Pastor Kevin, don't I read about other people in the New Testament who were called apostles and, um, and it's not one of those 13 people? And the answer to that is absolutely. You do see that in there. You see examples of Timothy and Silas and Barnabas and Junia, men and women called apostle at this point in the New Testament. And I would argue, and we're not going to go into the deep teaching of this today, because again, we're trying to cover this thing at a really high level today, but that is talking about the spiritual gift of apostleship, that these men and women have this spiritual gift of apostleship, right? You can almost think of it that there's capital A apostle, 13 people, people who put the scriptures together, and then there's small a apostleship of men and women who have this spiritual gift, but, and so what this gift does is this gift sees ministry in the church. It hears the mission and the vision of a local church. And that gift then begins to dream. See, that gift then starts looking at how ministry is done and what new ministries need to be created in order to accomplish a vision. What ministries in a church need to be shut down? because they're not actually accomplishing the mission. What new mission initiatives can we take on in the world? What new parachurch ministries need to be started? All of these things are created through this spiritual gift of apostleship. It's this supernatural gift, right? Where it's, you know, it could be in church planting. It could be in cross-cultural missions. It could be parachurch ministry. Or again, like I said, even just changing how a local church does things. One of the ways you can easily tell that you have a spiritual gift of apostleship (laughs) is if you get bored of church easily. (laughs) 
See, because church tends to be very difficult to change. Because, well, we like our church programs. We like the way we do ministry. And especially if we see ministry being successful. Like if we have a program and a lot of people are growing because of it and a lot of people are putting their faith in Jesus because of it and we have a ministry running for decades that way and it just every year just kind of dwindles and dwindles and dwindles and now there are a few people who still really like it and benefit from it but it's not you know, feeding people like it used to. It's not reaching people like they, it used to and now we've built all these policies and all these regulations in the church of why you're not allowed to shut that ministry down. <laughs> <laughs> because if you were to shut that down, it's like, oh my goodness, you're a total heretic and you're not a real Christian. Well, people with a spiritual gift of, of apostleship um, tend to be the leaders in churches who leave local churches first. <laughs> they tend to leave them because we don't know what to do with a spiritual gift of men and women who see how things need to change, who see how new things need to be created. And the other people go, nope, we can't do that. Nope, we're not going to change that. Nope, we're going to vote that down. And so that is kind of one of the big telltale signs that you have a spiritual gift of apostleship. It's how quickly you get bored. How quickly the day in, day in, day in, decade in, decade in of church ministry starts to wear on you because you see the change. You know when things have to happen. And so what sadly what happens is it's a big loss for the local church when the apostleship people leave because we desperately need them, right? We need them to come up with new ministry initiatives. We need them to start new cross-cultural ministry. You know, just think of some of the things that we've been dealing with culturally here in our own country in Canada. Like how do we restore race relationships? The stuff that's going on with indigenous people right now, all the hurting and all the brokenness in the world. If our ministry was already set up to reach and care for people like that, then we probably wouldn't have these problems because it would already be in place, but it's not in place. So we desperately need that spiritual gift of apostleship to open up our eyes to see ministry in a new way right? and to get us excited. Maybe you can tell I have that gift as well too because I tend to get very excited about this stuff as well, right? And so we can never allow any spiritual gift to get bored and to leave and to go do something somewhere else. Right, and so this. So we talk about teaching. Uh, we talk about apostleship here. We talk about exhortation. And again, just want to just remind you, as I said in the beginning, just a quick reminder here. You know, um, because these gifts that we're talking about today are so public. Right? The gift of teaching is very public. In fact, there's warnings to people who have that te that teaching gift in James chapter three, where it says, "Be mindful." Because people with the spiritual gift of teaching are going to be judged more harshly on how they use that gift. Why? Because it's very public. And we have the opportunity as teachers to take people down some very dark path. Take people down paths that are not true. In fact, that's the people Jesus critiqued the harshest were the teachers of the religious elite was the teachers of the word of God that Jesus was the harshest with, right? And so that's why in apostleship, in exhortation, in teaching, and like the other three gifts that we're going to look at, this is why character is so crucial. That's why your spiritual practices that we talked about for the first few weeks of this series are so crucial because you can be the best Bible teacher in the world, but if you got massive character flaws, your ministry is going to be very, very limited. You could have an amazing apostleship spiritual gift or a leader gift or a shepherd gift or an evangelist gift. But if you're not careful of your character, it can all come crashing down really, really fast. That's why I say all the time, I quote a big idea that I learned 18 years ago from Patrick Morley, the author of The Man in the Mirror. So I say it all the time. Even if you're right, you're wrong if you're not humble. Even if you're right, you're wrong if you're not humble. So that's just a little quick reminder <laughs> as we talk about these gifts. Okay, let's get into the back three here now. We're kind of in the second half of the sermon. So I forgot to hit start on my time watch. So 
we're going to keep going. <laughs> so I want to talk now about the spiritual gift of leadership today. We can read about leadership. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 8 verse, uh, sorry, uh, Romans 12 verse 8, where Paul says this. Again, very short, very direct. He says, if your spiritual gift, if it is to lead, then do it diligently. I love that word, diligently. Step up and lead. Don't be wishy-washy about it. Don't be, well, I don't know if I have to. And, well, I think maybe, and I'm not too sure. It's if your gift is leadership, then lead diligently. It doesn't mean to be a boss. It doesn't mean to be pushy. It doesn't mean to be arrogant. It doesn't mean to be self-righteous. But it means trust the Lord and do it. Lead. I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks in the church over the last 50 years has been a fear of leadership. And I think there's been such a big fear of it because we've seen a lot of bad leaders. <laughs> and we've seen people in the church try to lead as if it's the world. We try to lead the church like it's a business. We try to lead the church like it's politics. We try to lead the church like it's whatever we see out there in the world. Or we're trying to lead, but we've got massive character flaws in our walk with Jesus. And so we, because we're afraid of those bad leaders, we build up bad theology on what a leader is. And we put bad theology, we kind of try to do everything by committee. Or we tried to do everything by, I mean, I have a friend of mine who pastored a church. He pastored there for three years and it just destroyed him and he left it and he left ministry because he had to go to the congregation. He had to get 50 members in a room every single time he wanted to spend $25 or more. <laughs> $25. You can't even bring someone out for lunch for $25. And you got to get 50 people in agreement on that because they believed in this consensus of leadership. Now I'm all for consensus as the body of Christ, but that's not what leadership is because <laughs> we don't all have that gift, right? And so this is the spiritual gift of leadership in a church context. It's not like the world, right? Jesus speaks about this directly in Mark chapter 10, right? Jesus says this, Mark chapter 10 down in verse uh, 42, said, so Jesus called them, being his disciples, he called them together and he said, you know that those uh, who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, the spiritual gift of leadership in a church context is not about what the leader gets, but rather about what the leader gives. It's the leader who is willing to lay down their lives, lay down their preference, lay down their style, lay down whatever it is that they might be propping up for the sake of the body of Christ. The, and leadership, the spiritual gift of leadership is all about the what and the where. It's all about what the church should be doing. It's all about where the church should be going. It's not about the how it should be done, right? Spiritual leadership in the church, it's about vision, not implementation, Right? This gift is the special ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to get goals in accordance with God's purpose for the future of the church and to communicate that, communicate these goals to others in such a way that other people harmoniously and they voluntarily get engaged with it to make it happen. Right? Think of it like this way. When we came up with our vision as a church, we had a number of our leaders here at the church who've got this spiritual gift of leadership. And we fasted and we prayed and we were seeking God. And we felt that God had called us to this ministry to be a vibrant, growing Christian community engaged in reaching 10,000 people with the gospel. That is the vision 
that God gave us. And then right away when we presented that, some people started asking us, well, how are we going to do that? And I would say, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, well, what do you mean you don't know? You're the pastor. You're supposed to know. And it's like, well, I don't know yet because I haven't gotten my, administer, my administration people around me yet. I haven't gotten my apostleship people around me yet. I haven't gotten my exhortation people around me yet. I haven't got people praying about it yet. You see the difference here? <laughs> I think that's why, again, why spiritual gifts become so messy and why it creates so much tension is because we put expectations on someone's job or on someone's role in the church. And we go, well, you're supposed to know this. You're the pastor. You're supposed to do this. You're the pastor. And it's like, I don't know this. I don't do this because it's not my spiritual gift. My spiritual gift of leadership is to cast vision and to get other people to be excited about what God is doing in our church and to release them into their ministry. One of the best uh, explanations I've ever heard when it comes to the difference between leadership in the church and leadership out in the world is to think of Christian leadership in terms of rancher. And so, because so often we think that the pastor you know, is taking care of the sheep and when a church is small, that's what tends to happen. The pastor takes care of every individual sheep, every individual person in the church. But as a church grows, like our church has grown over the last number of years, the pastor is not able to do that anymore because there's just too many sheep. And it's not like you ever want to say, okay, sheep, go home, <laughs> go somewhere else. Because we look at our city, we look at our nation, the way Jesus looked at Jerusalem and we weep over it because we see these hurt, broken people. And we know they're like sheep without a shepherd. They need a shepherd. They need to know Jesus. So you never want to send people away. So the rancher ensures that the flock is healthy. The rancher ensures that there are shepherds to take care of the sheep. The rancher ensures that the entire flock is healthy. But then the sheep, the, the shepherd, makes sure the individual sheep is healthy. All right, so that's why leadership and shepherding, the next spiritual gift we're going to talk about, are very different. You can be a visionary leader in the church and not be a shepherd. Or you can be the sh a shepherd in the church and not be the visionary leader. And I love seeing churches kind of like, like what we did when I came here 11 years ago, when we recognized that, that these positions are not about positions, that we need to get people around the table with the right spiritual gift to accomplish what, what God wants to accomplish. When I see that happening, that's awesome. <laughs> that people aren't serving out of tradition or out of title, but rather out of gift. So let's then, now let's continue this thought into shepherding, right? This is the gift of pastor, that shepherd. It's the special ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to assume long-term personal responsibility for the spiritual welfare of a group of believers. And again, this is very relational. When the church is small, it tends to be the paid pastor that does it but I'm not saying that that's the way it has to be. In fact, a lot of times it works better when it's not the paid pastor. <laughs> it works better when it's the elders. That's why I believe in the plurality of elders. It's not that we're all the leaders and we make all the decisions on a team, even though we do discuss these things and pray about it and cast vision together, but we are all shepherding together. <laughs> that there are many people caring for all the sheep. It's not just going through one person right? Shepherding is very, like I said, sheep centric. They look after the flock. They give personal attention to each person, right? Jesus described shepherds as someone who is willing to lay down their life for the sheep. Again, how do you know you have a spiritual gift of shepherd compared to say a spiritual gift of helps or of mercy? It's like you have such a desire to see people well spiritually, that you sacrifice your time, that you sacrifice your, you know, your rights, your freedoms, and you make yourself available to care for other people. And when you do it, it doesn't exhaust you. It doesn't wear on you. It just brings you joy to love on people this way. 
right? That's why I so love how we've restructured our church over the last few years, long before the pandemic. We just knew we needed to be a church that does a better job of caring for one another. And that's why we implemented the care model here at Greenbelt, where we want every single person to be in a life group, because we believe that is the best place to receive care. I talk about this with Jen all the time, especially after kind of going through this book. And we desperately want someone with a spiritual gift of shepherd in each of those groups, shepherding people, caring for them. And then in our leadership roles, we make sure that the shepherds are okay, right? Ephesians chapter four says this, it says Christ gave, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That is our desire to see these gifts put in place, right? As a church, we want you to know your spiritual gifts so you can serve out of that. And spiritual care is so crucial. In fact, because our church has grown even more this year, we're going to make some changes to how we do spiritual care, how we do pastoral care. Because I don't ever want to be the bottleneck where people are not getting pastoral care because you can't get on my calendar because I'm too busy. Or, you know, or people not even reaching out to me or calling me for pastoral care because you assume I'm too busy. I am never too busy to care for people, ever. <laughs> but... We want to make sure that we actually have ministry that is sustainable and that more and more people with this gift can be caring for the people here at Greenbelt. So you're going to hear more about this later on in the year, but we take care very, very seriously. You know, we don't want anyone feeling like they're unloved or uncared for here. So that's how that, that's kind of the big difference between a leadership gift and shepherding gift. And then the last gift that I want to conclude our time together with today in this category of word gifts is the spiritual gift of evangelism. Again, this is another amazing, powerful, misunderstood, but greatly needed gift in the local church. You see, the Bible teaches us that every single follower of Jesus, again, is called to be a witness of Christ. All of us as followers of Jesus are called to be on mission with Jesus, to see more and more people put their faith in Jesus. You know, and so even though we're all called to witness, we're all called to be ambassadors, we're all called to share our faith, that's a different thing than a, the man or woman with the spiritual gift of evangelism, right? This spiritual gift of evangelism is a spiritual gift given by the Holy Spirit to certain Christians and gives them the unique ability to present the gospel in a compelling, clear way that opens up the listener's heart to take another step closer to Jesus. It's someone who is able to explain the scriptures in such a way, to share the good news of Jesus in such a way that it opens up someone's heart to take another step closer to Jesus, to take another step closer to Jesus, and then ultimately to surrender their lives to Jesus. See, again, our vision of being a growing, vibrant Christian community engaged in reaching 10,000 people with the gospel can't be done without the evangelist. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, when you read about the gift of the evangelist, the primary thing that the gift of the evangelist does is help the church become more evangelistic. To help the church remember that Ultimately, it's not about you. If you have already put your faith in Jesus and you are more concerned with what you get from the church than the fact that there are lost people in our city, that there are lost people in your family who are going to an eternity separated from God, if what you want is more important than that, the call of the evangelist is to get you to see your sin. <laughs> because it's sin when we are so much more concerned about what we get compared to that person in our city, that person in our family, that person that we go to school with, that person that we work with, that that person does not know Jesus. 
that that person doesn't know that there is a God who loves them. And that person doesn't know that God loves them no matter what they've done. You see, because that person has heard that they're no good. See, that person has heard how much of a sinner they are from Christians and from the church. And so they don't need that message. They already know that they're no good. They already know they're a sinner. And that's what John chapter 3 says when it says that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, and that God did not send Jesus in the, the world to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. Jesus came into the world to let our family, to let our friends, to let our colleagues, to let our neighbors know, no matter what you've done, God loves you. And he loves you so much, just as you are, that Jesus died for your sin. Because God is so holy, sin has to be dealt with. And he can't just ignore it the way we like to ignore it as people. But God knows we can't deal with our sin on our own. And out of his love for you, he came down. The second part of the Trinity, the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life. He did miracles. He did signs of wonder to affirm who he was, to affirm the power of God in the world. And then he went to a cross and he died a sinner's death for you. I love the story of the thief who's on the cross with Jesus. And this is a man who had no opportunity to clean up his life. He didn't have an opportunity to get right with God. He didn't have an opportunity to get his act together. He didn't get, have an opportunity to, you know, I'm just going to do all of these things first, and then I'm going to come to God. <laughs> As he's dying on the cross, he looks to Jesus, the son of God, and says, would you remember me when you come into paradise? And Jesus says, today, I tell you, you'll be there with me. Just as he was. Maybe some of you here are joining us today at Greenbelt Online and you have felt condemned by people. You've felt judged by people. And you've taken that to mean that God hates you or that God judges you. But I want you to know, God loves you. And there is judgment to come for your sin, just like there's judgment to come for my sin. But thanks be to God that God loves us so much, he doesn't leave us that we have to face that judgment because Jesus took that judgment for us. That when God looks at our sin and sees us as guilty, instead, the guilt, the shame that we should have received went on Jesus. And Jesus died in our place. And because of that, you and I are made new. You and I are brought into the family of God. And it's done so simply. It's done with one simple word, repent. Repent means turn around. Turn from the things that draw us away from God and turn our hearts back to God. You can do that real easy right where you are, just by praying, God, forgive me. God, forgive me for my sin. I know I love these sins, but God, I know deep down they keep me far from you. So God, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you that Jesus died for me. And Father God, come into my life and make me new. If you pray that prayer today, we want to celebrate and rejoice with you. A pop-up shows up here in the chat. If you would just click that, a little digital hand goes up so we can celebrate with you. And then another pop-up will be there that says, if you just click the button, it fills out a little simple form, just your name, your email address. That only comes to me. No one else sees that but me. I'm not going to broadcast your name. I'm not going to show up at your house. But I would just love to be able to email you some free resources to start you off well on your journey with Jesus. You see, that's why... All of these gifts are so important. Not one person has every single spiritual gift that we're looking at. All of us, every believer has a role to play in the mission and the vision of our church. So do you find yourself relating to any of these gifts today? 
He said, did you find yourself relating with any of the gifts that we talked about last week? If you do, what are you going to do about it? My encouragement would be to reach out to your life group leader, would be to reach out to a staff person, reach out to me on how you could be engaged in the ministry of our church to use your gift for God's glory. If after these two weeks, you're going, no, none of these sound like me yet. Coming to you next week. (laughs) You'll hear yours next week because we all have one. So it's going to come up. So let's pray together. Father God, I praise you and thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you for the diversity within the body, the different gifts that you have given each and every person who has put their faith in Jesus. And God, you call all of us to serve one another. You call us to use these gifts, not to hoard them and keep them for ourselves, but you give us these gifts, these divine abilities, you give them so that we can participate in the ministry of our church family to build other people up so that we would truly be this growing, vibrant Christian community. And as we are living out our faith, as we are growing in our knowledge of Jesus, then God, you will use us to reach 10,000 people and then some with the good news of Jesus Christ. So Father God, thank you so much for each and every gift in the body of Christ. And may God, we be good stewards of each and every one of those gifts. Would we use them well? So, Father, as we continue to worship, to speak and minister to all of our hearts, especially those of us who might still be struggling in learning how to use their gift, I pray, God, that you would give opportunity and give us next steps that each of us can take to grow in using our gifts. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.